is Mo already walking back his three starters comment? Because Ollie has thoughts. Coming up on Be Shafe Daily. What's going on, everybody? And welcome in to this edition of Be Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. It is the evening hours of Wednesday, October 4th, 2023, with some St. Louis Cardinals talk on the docket tonight as the MLB regular season, of course, ending a few days ago. The MLB postseason now underway with some of those wild card round teams advancing today. You had the, let's see, the Rays, the Rangers, the yet yeah, actually everybody has wrapped up their wild card series with the Phillies and Diamondbacks as of this recording, all advancing to the league divisional series round. Kind of a bummer that we won't have baseball now for the next couple of days. Would have liked to have seen one of those series at least advance to the decisive game three, but. We'll just have to wait until, I guess it would be Saturday, until the first games kick off of the LDS. No games Thursday, no games Friday. I think I'm getting that schedule correct. What we do know, though, is that the Cardinals no longer in contention for the 2023 World Series. Yeah, they're not going to be there, regardless of when these games are being played and when everything's scheduled. Cardinals aren't involved. But we're going to spend a lot of time this offseason, and that begins right now with this episode, talking about the Cardinals and whether or not capturing the 2024 World Series trophy is in the cards. Is it possible for the Cardinals to take a 71-win team and turn that around, make the postseason, and have an actually competitive team when it gets to October 2024? And can they put the roster together in this offseason that can catapult the team to that end? A lot of questions surrounding the Cardinals for sure, and so there will be a lot of things that need to be answered. This offseason, that's what we're planning to do on Be Shafe Daily. If you have not subscribed yet to the show, would love to have you on board this offseason. I'm really excited about the type of content that we're going to be able to put out there. Spotify and Apple Podcasts, two great ways to listen to the show. And you can also consume the show on YouTube. Going to be putting a lot of content, Cardinals baseball content on YouTube this offseason. So if you've not subscribed yet, would love to have you on board. There's no better time to do it than now. YouTube.com slash at bshafer12, just like my Twitter handle. And if you're checking it out on YouTube now, click that subscribe button, click like on this video, and drop your comments below as it pertains to the topics of the day. There's one thing I know I want to get to tonight, which is the mock trade proposal that I saw thrown out there on Twitter. We're kind of approaching that silly season where a lot of these sorts of things are going to fly across our social media timelines, and you have to sort of discern, okay, what's the source of some of this stuff? Is this just maybe a blog putting out something they think would be interesting? Is this a reporter saying, hey, these teams are in talks for such a trade? You have to be media literate with a lot of the stuff that comes around this time of year. And so not always are we going to dive into every little rumor that flies across on social media. But in this case, I think it does make sense to say, hey, this is something people are talking about. I tweeted it out after seeing it on Twitter earlier Wednesday. And so it makes sense now to address it and say, hey, realistic, not realistic. What is our read on this situation? And one of the names in the trade actually will lead me into the opportunity to talk about something that I teased on the last B-Shape Daily that I did, uh, kind of the season wrap-up Adam Wainwright edition a couple of days ago, because Ollie Marmel on Sunday in his office before Game 162 at Bush Stadium had a lot of very interesting comments, and comments that I think are going to impact the direction that we can expect the Cardinals to go this offseason. I got into a little bit of it on Sunday's episode, but I think today is going to be a day that after kind of getting into this trade proposal talking about one of the players involved in it and why maybe some of the comments that we heard from Ollie on Sunday could pertain to this individual, and then maybe I'll expand upon some of the Ollie stuff, which I, I feel like I've got an entire off season to get to talk about some of that stuff. There will be some new news perhaps later on, uh, maybe next week. I'm not 100% sure on when the postseason wrap-up uh, press conference will be. That could be, I assume, not this week, but maybe early next week. I'll try to get some more information on that and have – Obviously, news to talk about from whatever John Mozeliak might say. That's going to set the tone in many ways for the Cardinals offseason. However, I, I do think what Ali Marmel said on Sunday, there's some stuff from this that you, you probably have already heard. Maybe you've read it from various reporters that have written about it. Uh, I, I'm still circling the wagons on on kind of getting to it at this point. But that's what we're going to do a little bit in tonight's b Shape Daily. So thank you guys for being with me and listening. As always, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. I talked about having the trade proposal to sort of unpack and this one in particular comes from bleacher report i want to make sure i get the name right here 
Uh, Bleacher Report article, Zachary Reimer looks to be the writer for Bleacher Report that put this out. Uh, the Twitter account, at Nerds on the Bat, put it into my ether by posting a tweet about it and reacting with a screenshot of the trade proposal that related to the St. Louis Cardinals. Here is the proposal that Zachary Reimer came up with. And again, just because somebody is putting this out there doesn't mean it's about to happen or imminent. Anybody can say, hey, I think this would be a cool trade. And a lot of times people are going to be maybe off base on one way or another in terms of a trade. Sometimes they'll be spot on. And other times we'll really never know the answer because if two teams aren't talking trade about particular players, then we don't really know what it would take to get that player because those deals often don't come to fruition. But this trade in particular says the St. Louis Cardinals get right-handed pitcher Logan Gilbert from the Seattle Mariners. Logan Gilbert, obviously a bright, young, right-handed starting pitcher, workhorse type, front end of the rotation type of guy. The Cardinals certainly need a couple of those, maybe more than a couple of those. Might be able to get into the John Bozalak comments that he made to Jim the Cat Hayes on Sunday as well, which I just heard for the first time on Tuesday, maybe backing off of the three-starter comments and how something Ollie Marmel said on Sunday that same day Honestly, it kind of flies in the face of Mosellac backing off of those comments. So very interesting stuff that you do not want to miss. This is going to be an interesting episode. I'll try to pack it all into as brief of a time period as I can and make sure we're not wasting any time. But let's get to the trade proposal. Logan Gilbert, and who are the Cardinals giving up, according to Zachary Reimer, with this uh, mock trade proposal? Nolan Gorman, Brendan Donovan, and Tyler O'Neill. Okay, so there's a lot to do here, and I'll just go ahead and read the rest of this screenshot Uh, what Reimer had to write about his thoughts on this proposal, saying the Cardinals would presumably only do this deal if they're comfortable moving with Mason Wynn and Tommy Edmond as their double play combination. If so, the deal would net Seattle much needed help at second base and two guys who could shore up the outfield on either side of Julio Rodriguez. So that's kind of giving the Mariners angle on it. For the Cardinals, it would clearly be, okay, you got a lot of second base depth, you got a lot of infield depth, and maybe some of those guys that could play a little bit of extra outfield for you as well. Would you feel comfortable, though, moving your two top options for second base and rolling with Mason Wynn as your everyday shortstop, Tommy Edmond as your everyday second baseman. And then I guess if you were to trade Tyler O'Neill in this deal as well, you'd be looking to the outfield and saying, okay, uh, Ollie Marble said Sunday that Lars Nupar's best position defensively is in one of the corners, although he's done an admirable job in center. That was kind of his argument. But I, I took that as a little bit of a, okay, mark that for later. Manager, you know, nothing to lose really. The, the season's over. He can say, hey, Lars has done a great job in center. We think his best is in one of the corner spots, which would be the alarm bells to me of they're going to need to get a center fielder or decide that somebody in this organization already, maybe Tommy Edmond, is suited for that role. So if they're thinking that way, and we've talked a lot about whether Tommy Edmond makes sense going into the season as the everyday center fielder, because what you would be admitting essentially at that point is that you're going to have a little bit lesser of, of a punchy outfield offensively. Because I think Tommy Edmond, as much as I think he's a really valuable player, offensively, that's not his strong suit, especially if you're talking about facing right-handed pitching. He's always hit lefties really well, but overall, the kind of lackluster performance in recent years against right-handed pitching leads to him being about a league average hitter overall, 100 OPS plus, maybe a little below, maybe he could get to a point where he's a little bit above, but I think generally he's going to land right around in that area. And so my question would be, all right, Jordan Walker, if that's your right fielder, Lars Newpar, if that's your left fielder, I think both of those guys can be solidly above league average producers offensively, whether that's 110 to 120 in terms of the OPS plus, or if you prefer the weighted runs created plus, those numbers are relatively similar between baseball reference or fan graphs, depending on where you get your info and what you'd like to look at. Take a look at Lars Newpar this year. I know that Jordan Walker was right around that 100 number. Newpar finished at 115 OPS plus. And the previous season, 2022, he was a 124. So that 124 would mean 24% above average. This past year, in 2023, he was 15% above league average offensively. In Jaywalk, Jordan Walker finishing his year out at a number that I can't find because it's pulling up his minor league numbers. That's the one thing I hate about baseball reference when it comes to the younger prospects. I want to just see his major league page, which will give me the OPS+. plus. Okay, I'm finding it now. His OPS+, plus is 114. So right around the same as Lars Newpar, two guys that are about 15% above league average offensively in your corners. That'll do. But if Tommy Edmonds a little bit below, let's say he's 95 OPS plus, I think he was probably something in that range this season. Does that give you enough punch in your outfield overall? Has sort of been my question, especially if, I mean, Edmonds the other shortstop on this team. So if you are basically allocating him to center field, 
Yeah, Tommy was a 91 OPS plus this year, which means 9% below average for his career. He is exactly 100, a league average offensive player over the course of his career in the big leagues, which has been like five years or so. So if that's what you get, 90 to 95 OPS plus for Tommy Eben, let's keep, let's be generous and say 100. He's going to continue to be right at league average. Is that enough? Because typically you want to have a robust offensive production across your outfield. And 115, 100, 115, is that going to be enough? I think so. Potentially, if you have Nolan Arenado, what does he need to be at third base, right? Because the corners on your infield should ideally be carrying you offensively in a lot of ways. And so if Arenado ends up around, you know, 125 OPS plus, I'm just saying that off the top of my head, I think that would be perfectly fine for his career. He's a 122. Last year, he was a 151 when he was an MVP candidate. This year, though, just a 109 for Nolan Arenado. So you have to sort of wonder, okay, keeping in mind where the Cardinals want to be offensively, they were, I don't know, right around maybe a top 10 offense this year. I guess I could look and see and run scored. I'm sure they dipped below that in run scored this season because they had been around like the top five to 10 area and seemed to kind of crater toward the end. Although that big performance, what did they do to the Reds on Saturday night, the second to last game of the season? They put a lot of runs out there. Nope. They finished 19th in run scored. So that had gotten away from me a little bit. So no, this was not a top 10 offense. It's not a top 10 lineup. Nothing of the sort this year for the St. Louis Cardinals. It has to be better. I know that you might look on paper and say, Hey, a lot of the guys that we have, uh, you know, got got hurt, or we just decided not to to risk it with them and some of the injuries they may have been battling through at the end of the season. But all in all, they got to be better. OPS was 13th, so a run scored 19th. OPS a three way tie for 13th, which really makes you about 15th. You're middle of the pack. The Cardinals' offense needs to be better. Point blank in 2024, it has to be better. So we're asking ourselves, okay, where is that coming from? This is more of an all encompassing look than I necessarily was intending to give, but I promise it's going somewhere. Let's look at Paul Goldschmidt. All right, because we've we basically said 115, 100, 115 across the outfield. We're going across the infield now. We're at least looking at the corners because those have to be your big boppers. Arenado was just a 109. Can he be better? He's going to have to be. He's not getting old yet necessarily. He's still in his early 30s, so he's going to have to be better than he was if the Cardinals are going to be better than they were. Paul Goldschmidt, what would we say about that? I would say Paul Goldschmidt at the 120 OPS that he had this year. It wasn't the 177 career high that he had when he was the MVP last season. But 120 OPS, I w- OPS plus, I should say, you take that from Paul Goldschmidt in 2024. I don't think that's necessarily too big of an issue. Then you can figure out second base, which in the world of this trade proposal, you have both of your second basemen going to Seattle, but that would move Tommy Ebb into second, and then you'd have to get an outfielder because Newt Barr, Jordan Walker, Alec Burleson, is that your outfield? Richie Palacios, I think, is a good fourth outfielder, but I don't think he's somebody that... Look, if you're penciling him into your starting three to begin the 2024 regular season, I think something has gone wrong. Um, you like those kinds of guys to be around for depth, but you don't necessarily say, hey, we're going to allocate a spot for you. Dylan Carlson is kind of a forgotten man in all of this, but with his injuries and his lack of performance, it's a question to me of what his future is going to be with the Cardinals. I think his future is a little more certain than Tyler O'Neill's, or Let's not say certain. O'Neill's future is almost more certain in that I don't think he's going to be here. Carlson, I think, is up in the air. There's, It could go either way on whether or not uh, he's with the team to begin 2024. And I honestly think it could boil down to what's the value for Dylan Carlson in a trade? Because if the Cardinals are looking to add pitching, and we know that the number is three starting pitchers, that is what John Mosellock had said in August. It's what Ollie Marnell reiterated, and I'll give you the exact quote here in a little bit. Reiterated Sunday that it's what needs to happen is getting three starting pitchers. Mosellock then said, well... I think when I said three, it was at a time where... We were really down to one starter at that point. And I will say, you know, we are still bullish on Matt's. We think, like, from a physical standpoint, he'll be in a good spot next year. I think, uh, really, Thompson has stepped up. But we know we're going to need some big innings, some quality innings. And at the very least, we also know we're going to have to add some depth there because we're going to need some protection. Certainly pleased with what we saw out of Rom. But, you know, what will his role be next year? Hard to say. And so lots of questions that we can be asking ourselves right now. But that'll help build the GPS for this offseason. So that was John Mozeliak to Jim the Cat Hayes on the Bally Sports pregame on Sunday. Basically backing off of the we are going to go out and get three starters comments. And, like, I personally don't think there's any room for him to have said what he said on Sunday. Aldi Marble doesn't either. I want to be 100% clear about this. I'm going to read you the direct quote. First, I'm going to read you the quote from Mosellock. And then I promise I'm going to get back into, because what I was doing was kind of going through the 
the Cardinals' position player group in deciding do they have enough offense to go from 19th in runs scored, 13th in OPS, to actually be the top offense that they claim to be, right? They believe everything that was said by Ollie, and when you ask the players, they think, yeah, we've got a good group of hitters. And that may be true, but the performance of the team was what it was this year. So are there ways to augment the offense from the outside for next year, I think, is also going to have to be a part of that. I think Ollie and the Cardinals realize that, but, you know, we're kind of having to go off of what they say. I'm going to get back into that part of it, but since I gave you the Mo quote, I want to give you this from Mo on August 14th to make sure it's 100% clear that what he said on Sunday is a contradiction to what he had said previously where he said, quote, realistically, this on August 14th, realistically, we know we have to add three starters this offseason, period. We know we have to add depth. We went into this season thinking we would have that covered. It didn't work out that way. I think having a repeat of that would not be in the best interest of the franchise. So I think our approach is going to be very aggressive on the pitching side. Realistically, we know we have to add three starters this offseason, period. That is the quote, right? And so then Sunday he references that and says, well, when I said that, I, what I meant was, okay, but that's not, look, they weren't really even down to one starter either. He said, when I said that, we were down to one starter, so it seemed worse than it was. Okay, well, let's walk through that then. When did Steven Matz get hurt? That's the first question I have. He might be right about this. Okay, so Steven Matz had pitched on the 12th of August. Mo makes the comments, and by the way, pitched well. We didn't really know. Uh, I guess I should look up exactly what day Matz goes to the IL. But th- this would have been like that. Okay, that exact same day. So Mo gets a pass on this part. That day, Matz goes on the IL. But you knew that he was going to be a part of it for next year when you're making these comments because he's being paid and that was the plan. And to Matz's credit, he did look better down the stretch after he got reinserted into the rotation. But he pitches on the 12th of August. He gets put on the IL on the 14th. That same day, Mo says, we got to add three starters. You know you've got Miles Michaelis. You know you've got Steven Matz. That's the math. The other three up for grabs. And then he comments about Zach Thompson looking good down the stretch, which is fair. I think Zach Thompson showed some, you know, some nice things. It's Zach with a K. I'm Googling to make sure I have his stats. Zach Thompson with a K. The other Zach Thompson that's in the big leagues is Zach with an H, just in case you needed that. He had a 4.4 ADRA this season. You look down the stretch of the season, all right? He's saying, I said three starters because we were down to one starter, and then we saw some good performances from the young guys. Okay, one of the young guys that we're talking about is Zach Thompson. I'm just going to read you his final five starts of the season, game logs. Seven innings, three runs. It's pretty good. Five innings, three runs. Okay, five innings, four runs. Okay, five innings, four runs. Okay, five and a third, two runs. All right, that's nice. That's not not the kind of groundbreaking, difference-making performance down the stretch that's going to make you go, Hey, I thought we needed three starters, but actually we don't. Actually, we got more than we thought. He mentioned Drew Rahm by name. Drew Rahm. We liked what we saw from Drew Rahm, but we don't know what his role is going to be. I know what it can't be is the number five starter going into the season. The guy had an 8.02 ERA. I think he's an interesting live arm that you can hone and can potentially help you. I'm not trying to diminish Drew Rahm, but don't tell me that you saw Drew Rahm and that made you realize that we actually don't need three starters, we being the St. Louis Cardinals. I'm... I'm being Mo right here, so I would not I would normally not say, we, that's not my team, that's your team, Cardinals fans. But here's the thing, Jerome had an 8 ERA, all right? Moselak, careful there not to mention Dakota Hudson's name in that clip to Jim Hayes, because I think if he had, Cardinals fans, he knows, would have lost it, which is not fair to Dak, by the way. Uh, Dak needs to be mentioned over Jerome, because Dakota Hudson actually did do some things down the stretch that, you know, would, would, would he was competitive. Drew Rahm was not competitive. He had an ADRA. Dakota Hudson, I can read you his numbers. They weren't quite as good over the final five starts as Zach Thompson, but I think Dak had some better ones before that. Five innings, five runs, four innings, four and a third, seven runs, five and three, six and two, five and three. It's not drastically different from what Zach Thompson did. It is in the strikeout area because Dakota Hudson, the one thing that I consistently said on B-Shape Daily that he would have to do down the stretch to gain consideration for next year's rotation. It wasn't likely to do because we know what kind of pitcher he's been for his whole career, but he would have to, what, strike more guys out and miss more bats. Two, two, three, two, three. Those are the strikeout totals for Dak, the final five starts. For Zach Thompson, six, six, four, four, five. So a little bit more there in terms of the strikeout juice. But still, given up, I mean, four and a half ERA, Dak had a 4.95 ERA, or 4.98 ERA, Drew Rahman, 8.02 ERA. Those were the guys that, and Libertor was moved to the bullpen. Like, I could go on. 
those were the group of young pitchers that when John Mozeliak said, well, I said three starters, but then, you know, we saw some good things down the stretch from the young guys that had a chance. That is not the reality that any of the rest of us live in. I don't know what purpose that would serve to say other than to begin to soften the blow potentially if they are unable to come up with three in the offseason because very famously everybody latched on to the three quote because he said it. I'll, I'll read it again. Realistically, we know we have to add three starters this offseason, period. And the part that it, the part that comes next is even more important when he says we went into this season thinking we'd have the depth covered and it didn't work out. And that having a repeat of that would not be in the best interest of the franchise. So you have to do it differently. You have to approach it differently. But we're hearing already the comments of, well, maybe we're not going to be as aggressive as I said we would be in August. That would be a mistake. And I, I, I almost have to just throw the Sunday quote from Mosaic out the window, especially, and again, I promise I'm going to get back into the position player stuff. This all ties together and connects, so stay with me. But that same day that Mosaic said what he said to Jim Hayes that you just heard there, Ali Marmel was in his office saying the opposite. Talking a lot about, and I'm just going to read you some quotes from Ali. This will be in stories as well, but I want you to hear some of the things that Ali said. Again, this was in the office with the writers before Sunday's game. So I'm not going to play in the audio from that. That's not how that works when you're when it's when it's there as a writer. But I can talk about these quotes and write about these quotes. He says, "If we're not competing for a championship next year, that's a mistake. This isn't to take two to three years to see where we're at type of thing. Like it's next year. It's one of the things that always said. Setting the tone for what the expectations should be. In the money quote that I know Jeff Jones tweeted this one out, and this is one that we're going to probably unpack another day." because it's not directly compared to what we're talking about. It is a little bit. It's the one that I teased off the top. This is going to carry you, though, through a number of days this offseason. Where Ollie Marmel says, quote, and this is a direct quote. I, he was, and I'll, and I'll clarify, Derek Gould had asked him, what happens first? What's the first step to getting this thing fixed? You guys say you're confident you could fix it in one winter. One offseason can make the change. What's the first step? And he took a pause and said, I want a clubhouse full of guys that have one thing on their mind, and that's not themselves. It's winning a championship. So you start out by weeding those out. Essentially, weeding out the guys that are thinking about themselves. And that's a bold thing to say, for sure. And, you know, I know people took it a different way. Some people already have it in their heads. Well, Ollie Marmel is so arrogant, you know, throwing his players under the bus. It's interesting to me that the, that Cardinals fans can watch a team go 71-91 and 91 and not think that there are some players that that weren't right for the mix, that, for lack of a better phrasing, should be under the bus a little bit. Now, because you've made it up in your mind that Ollie Marmel is the problem and not the players that are underperforming, not the pitchers that aren't getting out or the hitters that aren't hitting in clutch situations, but it's the manager's fault, if that's your worldview, then okay, I can understand how you would hear Ollie say, whoa, why is he saying that you, we've got to weed out the guys that are thinking about themselves instead of winning a championship? I don't know what else, if I were a baseball fan, if I were a Cardinals fan, I don't know what else I would want to hear from the manager other than what Ollie Marmel said there. Yes, get the guys out of here who don't want to be a part of this. Is it harsh? Sure. But I also I, I also don't think it's wrong. And there are going to be differing opinions on that, and I can respect that, Cardinals fans. But when I hear a quote like that, and there's a lot of speculation, who is he talking about? You know, there's a number of people he could be talking about. Who Who is this geared toward? And maybe that's the wrong way to look at it because I think more generally it's just a philosophical statement of like, we just need guys that are going to be bought in. That's not any different than what any baseball, football, basketball coach would say. You want guys that are going to be bought in, right? I think that's a pretty standard thing. But given the implication of some of the things that happened this year, people are, are jumping to the conclusions of who the players might have been that he was talking about. Tyler O'Neill is an obvious name that a lot of people would jump to. Is I, I don't know if that's 100% exactly what this was, what inspired this. However, I don't think Tyler O'Neill's on the team next year. I, I would call it an upset at this point. Like a, a thing that is unlikely to occur, that would, that would be where I sit. So when I see a Twitter trade, trade poll, I told you it was all going to come full circle, that lists Tyler O'Neill in it, I don't blink at that because I go, yeah... The Cardinals are probably going to try to move him. At the deadline, they didn't move him in July. They didn't move him August 1st because they were still in a position where they wanted to kind of see what they had. And it's not that Tyler O'Neill played terribly down the stretch. He actually, offensively, I think, 
found a little bit of a, of another gear compared to before all the injuries early in the season that he had, and he missed a lot of time, was out with the back, and you know couldn't get it right. And are there some lingering feelings about that? Like, it took him a long time to get back. Why is that? Is that fair to Tyler O'Neill to say, dude, what has taken so long for a, you know, a little back injury, can't get back? I think that would be unfair if that's the attitude because we don't know everything that he that he went through and battled through and dealt with and got second opinions. And, you know, they, I'm not going to sit here and say the guy didn't want to be out there. However, the optics do take the toll eventually. And when you get back and the whole narrative is we're going to, and again, you might say I am overblowing a situation by, by hearkening back to what I'm about to say. But when you go into kind of the make or break second half for Tyler O'Neill, and the whole thought process is, and this was shared by Ollie Marmel, and he actually he talked about him and Tyler O'Neill being on a really good, same page, good place about the plan moving forward. And the idea was we're going to make sure we rest him appropriately so that when he's out there, we can get 100% of him. We can get everything he's got because when Tyler O'Neill's out there with 100% of what he's got, he's a really valuable player to a baseball team. These are words that Ollie Marmel was saying. So for people to say, oh, Ollie hates Tyler O'Neill, well, it's more complex than that. But he needs guys that are bought in. And so when you see what happens of they've got a game plan of when he's going to rest, when he's going to be able to to recuperate, but when he's going to be out there and, and balls to the wall, go play and go help the Cardinals win baseball games. And that's a plan that all parties feel good about. And then you go to Tampa. And then the knee tweak happens where it's like, is it a knee injury? Is it your knee? What is with the knee and you can't play on the turf? Because it was multiple days that he was in the lineup and then scratched. And if you saw, if you can think back to Ollie Marmel talking about those those days, and I watched both of the press conferences on TV after because I wanted to see his tone. If you saw his tone, man, I looked at that and said, it's over. I mean, the Tyler O'Neill experience is over. I think it ended then. Am I reading too much into that? I don't know. We're all just sitting out here speculating on certain stuff. We're all coming at it from different angles. But I looked at that and thought, that's not the vibe of what Ali Marmel and the Cardinals felt confident and comfortable with Tyler O'Neill regarding like coming back and saying, we're going to know when we can have him and we're going to be able to count on him when we need him. That right there, I said, man, maybe his knee is injured, but you've heard of the straw that broke the Campbell's back. To me, I wonder if that was it. Now, Tyler O'Neill is still on this roster. And so we'll see if any of this comes to fruition via trade, whatever. But there's also an element of like, eventually a guy could use a fresh start. So when I hear that quote from Ali, yeah. Tyler O'Neill is the name that comes to mind for me, but I don't think it's as egregious as maybe a lot of people took it to say that, you know, Ollie is banishing Tyler O'Neill like he doesn't have that power. First of all, it's going to be a, a, a joint situation with the front office to maybe find a a, a trade landing spot for Tyler O'Neill. But that's one to watch. I think, yeah, you hear that quote, let's not play dumb about it. I think that's one to watch. Speculation about Ryan Helsley, I don't know. that Again, Ryan Helsley w- went out there is a great performer. A lot of the rumors and stuff that, that leaks out about, well, he was unhappy about the arbitration. Yeah, I mean, he talked about that in spring. That was no secret. I was standing two feet from the guy when he said, yeah, that was a hard thing to do and have your team throw you under the bus in the arbitration hearing by saying you weren't available enough. Well, this is one that I can kind of see both sides of, and I'm not saying this from having had Ryan Helsley tell me this. This is just this is my read, all right? I'm reading the situation, reading the tea leaves. Here's how I view that whole thing. Ryan Helsley in 2022 was famously not used in back-to-backs very often. They were careful with him. They managed his workload. But that was described all season long by Ollie Marmel as like a team-oriented, here's what we want to do to make sure Ryan Helsley is healthy toward the end. And he was healthy toward the end. The finger injury that happened in Pittsburgh is what cost him in the playoffs against Philadelphia. And when he comes out for that second inning and it numbs up on him and the rest is history, the Cardinals lose that game. But Ollie Marmel has talked since then about, like, the plan was have this guy ready as a horse for the playoffs, have him fresh. It all lined up perfectly except for the fluke injury with the finger. So Ryan Helsley struggling in the playoff game because of an injury was not because they, you know, overworked him. That was a fluke finger injury. That's a different thing. But it's very interesting that it can be described by the team and maybe it was just Ollie making the best of a, of a situation that they weren't thrilled about with Helsley not always being available. But Ollie certainly did a good job of describing it in a way that was like, hey, we want this guy to be healthy and ready to go when it matters the most. So we're cool with not using him back-to-back, not using him for multiple innings when it's not necessary during the season of 2022. So 
if that's the way it's approached and if Ryan Helsley is, you know, feeling that side of the communication as well and is on board with it, then it was probably, it had to have felt like a blind side to Ryan Helsley when he gets in the arbitration hearing and hears this dude wasn't available. We needed him more than, than he was willing to go. And then he loses his hearing and you tie that to it and think, oh my gosh, I thought I was on the same page with my team about, you know, they kept telling me, hey, you know, if, if, if you need a day, if you need to just make sure you're good he may have felt like there was a bit of a bait and switch is my wonder. Now, again, I haven't asked him this. It's not like I, you know, he might give you a real answer, but at the same time, it's like, that's a very sensitive topic. And especially while it's still going on, you're still with the Cardinals. It would be a tough one to, to, I think, expand upon if you're Ryan Helsley. But wouldn't that make a little bit of sense where, you know, it's described one way and then that very thing comes back to burn you in arbitration. So I could see there being a little bit of a, you know, like a, Hey, whoa, what happened here? Why is that being held against me didn't see that coming and maybe some miffed feelings about that but that was February right that was spring training when he's talking about that and I don't necessarily have reason to believe that if those feelings existed that they lingered um but again this is just kind of we're speculating about maybe what may have gone on but what I can say is that it looked like in 2023 when healthy Ryan Helsley was used a little bit more in back-to-backs they did try to elevate that and maybe that comes from Helsley just going well I, I can't have it happen to me again where they try to hold those things against me in an arbitration hearing, so I want to try to be more available, and maybe he pushes himself as a result. Well, he got hurt. So whatever the feelings might be there, you could see how he th- he would think, okay, I tried to push myself, and then the, the exact thing that I was worried about happening is what happened. I got injured and wasn't available for a stretch of the season, which is, of course, going to be held against me in arbitration. I don't know that there's any ill feelings about that from Ryan Helsley toward the team. I know some of that has been reported or speculated upon, but like we can just say in a vacuum, like could see how some of those things might develop. But I, again, I am not saying that is how Ryan Helsley feels. That's not my position to do by any means, but I wonder how the Cardinals feel about it on the flip side. To me, I wouldn't see any reason for the Cardinals to feel any type of way about Helsley other than just like they would feel about anybody if they're not consistently available. But, like, on the surface, to me, that's not the vibe that I have gotten from Ryan Helsley and his availability. Like, it was like, okay, if in 2022 you guys are, whether they were heading it up or Ryan was heading it up himself to limit the workload, it was a plan that I think worked until a fluky finger injury. So, like, it wouldn't be fair to bake that into the Ryan Helsley story of, well, he's not available, not reliable, because that was a fluke. Like, I'm going to maintain that till the day I die. That's not fair to pin on Helsley, and I really don't think it's fair to pin on Ollie Marmel other than he should have probably recognized it a little bit earlier in that ninth inning in, against Philadelphia and taken him out one batter sooner. That's that's the best I can give you, Cardinals fans. But Ollie has since said, I mean, yeah, sure, I could have taken him out, but that's a guy with a one ERA. If we're going to go down, we're going to go down with that guy. That was the mindset that he had at the time. Not to rehash something that happened a year ago too much. But anyway, like those are the two names, Tyler O'Neill and Ryan Helsley, that people would go, oh, is that what Ollie Marmel is talking about? When he says we got to weed those guys out, I don't know that that's the case, but I'm giving you the context for both of those situations. I expect Tyler O'Neill not to be here. I I don't know what to expect as it pertains to Ryan Helsley. I think it would be foolish to trade Ryan Helsley, who should have value to a 2024 pitching staff, and if his trade value doesn't match that, I don't necessarily think it makes sense to move him. But he's going to get a raise in arbitration, even with the injury, because that's the way arbitration works. Again, if the Cardinals are pinching pennies and that's where they decide to pinch them, I think it's probably a mistake. You need as many dynamic Ryan Helsley-type arms in your bullpen as you can have, and they don't have a bunch of them right now. They've got JoJo and Helsley. Those are the two, right? I mean, uh, remember July when they DFA'd Henesis Cabrera, and I said it'll be over one and a half playoff strikeouts this year for Henesis Cabrera, and I said it before he even signed with anybody or was traded to anybody. Yeah, he had two strikeouts for the Blue Jays in game one. Now, granted, the Blue Jays are watching from home now just like everybody else, but it still happened. He was dynamic for the, for the playoff Blue Jays. So you want as many of those types of arms as you can have, and unless there's like a bridge burned with Ryan Helsley that I am just underestimating the degree to which that's a thing, I, I think you should probably be back on the team next year because I'm not sure you're going to get fair value in a trade. But if Mo is able to maximize the value of any player any asset and and do it for the betterment of the team moving forward then I don't think anybody would necessarily have a problem with that with O'Neill it's almost like find him a new home time I think because I, they they put everything they had into him this year they let him be the center fielder they gave him every opportunity and it just to me I don't know how you could evaluate it any other way than it didn't work out and 
availability has to be part of the equation, and he, I don't, I don't know. He might have it for somebody next year. Maybe he was with the Cardinals, he don't have it with the Cardinals. I don't know. But I, I just would say that the worry of, oh no, we're going to give away the next to Rosarena, like he's a free agent to be in one more year, and you've kind of got a very full picture of what he's been, and you know he's dynamic when he's healthy, but can you keep waiting around? Can you spend another year where you say, we're going to make that bet again because that's one of the bets that burned us this past year. That would be my question from the Cardinals' perspective as it pertains to Tyler O'Neill. And when you hear things like that from from Ali, and I think back to the, I can't play because my knee doesn't feel right. It's not that I have a knee injury. It just doesn't feel right to play on the turf. And he did play the last game on turf in that series, but he missed two in a row, was written in the lineup, and then wasn't. And I don't think that happened by accident. I think that is Ali Marmol like, all right, let's play him. Let's you, you can play. You're on the team. Let's play. And then two days in a row, couldn't play. So for me, like if you were trying to stretch it and find paths to connect to that quote from Ollie on Sunday, that would be one that I say, yeah, I mean, I can see where you're coming from if you view it that way. And we'll just have to wait and see whether or not, you know, Tyler O'Neill is a part of this moving forward. But that was my my long preamble. That was my, my context to talking about this trade proposal and this outfield thing. Because Tyler O'Neill would be a guy that you would think would be above 100 league average OPS plus, but if he's not in the picture, how do you square the circle of getting enough offensive production when you make a trade like sending away Brendan Donovan and Nolan Gorman for a and a starter? Like I'm not even commenting upon Logan Gilbert. He'd be a great guy to get. Cardinals need three pitchers. Moe's already acting like they're not going to get three. So certainly, if one of them can be Logan Gilbert and the other one like Anola or a Sonny Gray or whatever, maybe both. Then you can you can probably live with that, but and we'll do we'll do some Nola Sunny Gray stuff that might be tomorrow's episode or uh, later in the week when I have another chance to do a podcast. But you're looking at the Logan Gilbert thing and thinking, okay, yeah, if you're going to get a pitcher via trade, like that's a great guy to get. But to give up Donovan and Gorman, yeah, the O'Neill part again, we think he might be somebody that fits. But the other two, if you were to do that, do you have enough offense when you're already questioning whether you have enough offense if Tommy is your center fielder? Because I'm looking at Mason Wynn as the shortstop, not expecting him to be a 100 OPS plus. I think he'll be below that probably in a full season next year. If I'm wrong, the Cardinals are really in a good spot because he will have, you know, probably the the eight or nine spot in the batting order for the most part when he plays. And I think he is still a work in progress offensively as a major league hitter. He hit 172. Slug 238, 230 uh, on-base percentage with a 467 OPS for a 29 OPS plus. Not good, but a small, 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 small sample size. And had 122 at-bats, by the way, below 130. He's still a rookie for next year if he's able to kind of take this cup of coffee, learn uh, learn a lot after it, and come out and look like a completely different player at the plate next year, which I think is within the realm of possibility because when you look at his numbers at AAA, he had an 834 OPS and was a very dynamic player offensively and defensively in AAA. So all of that is still in front of Mason Wynn, but I would have to factor in my expectations for the offense if I am saying, hey, you've got to be better offensively than you were this year. Where is that going to come from if you're trading away Dylan, or pardon me, uh, Brandon Donovan and Nolan Gorman for one pitcher? I don't think that's a feasible trade. That's the bottom line to the trade proposal from Bleacher Report. No, I don't see that as realistic. Could I see the Cardinals trading one of the two? Or one of a Gorman, Donovan, Tommy Edmond in the offseason? Sure. But the way they've talked about Tommy Edmond and Brendan Donovan in terms of how valuable they are and their leadership and their clubhouse presence and the impact they make, it's not that they're not saying good things about Nolan Gorman, but the praise about Brendan Donovan matches what I see in Brendan Donovan when I'm in the clubhouse, when I'm watching them play. He is about as valuable as any Cardinal. He is untouchable to me. And there are going to be people hearing this that say, what are you talking about? Nolan Gorman could hit 40 home runs if he's healthy. Like that's the kind of power that he has. Not many people in baseball can say that as, as their ceiling. And I would say, I totally agree with you and understand that. And you're not wrong. I would still say Brendan Donovan is the guy that you say he's not available. Don't ask. Lars Newbar is that in the outfield? And on Sunday, a lot of conversation about Lars Newbar from Molly Marmel saying, yeah, we still haven't seen the best of him. And again, he was 15%, 14, 15% above league average over the last couple of years offensively. Brendan Donovan, by the way, 115 OPS plus this year, uh, 124 OPS plus as a rookie. 
he's going to be 15 to 20 percent above league average as well. I can find Nolan Gorman's, which I think is valuable in this conversation, because if there's anything that Nolan Gorman does bring to the table, it's what he what he does offensively. There's no question about that. So let's make sure we find that and are aware of that. OPS plus of 117 this year. He was a 104 his rookie year. So 117 for Gorman, 115 for Brendan Donovan. I I know that they come about it in different ways. They're very similar in terms of their value to the team offensively. Donovan is going to have a 50-point higher batting average. He's going to have a 30-some-odd point higher on base most of the time. Uh, the sluggy percentage for Gorman was 478. It was 422 for Donovan. The OPS for Donovan was 787, and for Gorman it was 805. I think Donovan probably ultimately is going to be closer to that 787, 790, push in 800 if I had to guess. But again, for, he's 26 years old, and he's been a 779, so maybe that's just what he is. The value that he brings defensively, he's a gold glove winner in his first year, can play anywhere on the field. Leadership in the clubhouse. I, I'm just, I'm going to die on the hill that he is a very valuable player to the Cardinals and you don't trade him. I'm not saying, don't take that as you, oh, go trade Gorman, because I'm not saying that. You only trade Nolan Gorman if you're getting the answer to the rotation. A Logan Gilbert type. You're not getting George Kirby. But like, I'm, I'm saying you got to find a way to get the Dylan Cease, like, if you have a legit answer, and maybe Dylan Cease doesn't even qualify as that. He didn't have a great year. But that's the world in which I trade Nolan Gorman. Otherwise, I say, we're yeah, we're rallying around these guys because your offense as the St. Louis Cardinals needs to be better next year than it was this year. And if you trade away from that, where where are you adding to augment? Because you're a mid-pack offense this year. You are not an elite offense. They said they were going to be a powerful offense. They were pretty good, close to that when healthy, but still kind of underperforming in that regard, especially in the clutch, runners in scoring position. So they fell short. Take away from the offense the some of the meaningful players that helped you when you were good. Where does it get better? And that's a fair question. I think Jordan Walker is part of that answer. I think Mason Wynn can be part of the answer, but it's a big expectation to think it'll happen this soon. I think just modest improvements from already solid numbers by Lars Newtbar and Brendan Donovan could be part of that. Arenado bouncing back a little bit should be part of that. Goldschmidt maybe a little bit more than he brought this year. He's not happy with the year that he had. Definitely a decline from his 2022 numbers. And and like we didn't even mention Wilson Contreras. That's going to be a whole thing. And people talk about, well, why are you keep talking about Contreras might not be the catcher? Let's hear what comes out on Monday or whenever the end of season press conference is. And John Mozeliak is asked about, hey, what's the deal with the catcher position? It's not my opinion that he shouldn't be the catcher. It's the Cardinals have shown that they, you know, might have an inclination to think about Kisner or Herrera, whoever ends up being the other catcher, and one of them may be gone. And I, I have a hard time with saying either of those guys should be traded or, or moved on from because I think both of them did a nice job this year. But Wilson Contreras was also one of the, I mean, I think he tied for the lead on the Cardinals and wins above replacement. At uh, on, on baseball reference, 3.4 wins above replacement. He had an 826 OPS in a 124 OPS plus. That's what you paid for, and it needs to be that way again next year, but at what position? And it may very well just be catcher, and he works and is diligent, and everybody just calms down a little bit about him not being Yadier Molina, and everybody's fine with it. I'm interested to see what's said, because what has been said by Mosellock when asked about it was, we're going to table that conversation for the offseason as to what they're going to do everyday catcher or not for Wilson next year or position change or whatever. He said that's going to be something we talk about in the offseason. Well, it's the offseason, so maybe it's time to talk about it. And if it's much ado about nothing and he's just going to be the catcher, okay. And then it's a battle between Kisner and Herrera, I think, to decide who's around long term because I don't know if you carry three catchers. And that'll be another situation of don't make the wrong choice. Um, I think Andrew Kisner is another guy that's very valuable to this clubhouse. I know that Cardinals fans sometimes don't like when I say that because they see his numbers maybe not being so great over the years and they just kind of dismiss him. I wouldn't dismiss him. I think he's important to this team. That can be true simultaneous to Contreras being important to the team and Herrera being a bright young prospect. All those things can be true at the same time. But I'm just saying kind of what my read on everything is. But I dove into the whole pitching conversation and reading the quotes about needing three starting pitchers. And I want to make sure I give you the the full Ollie Marmel quote about three starting pitchers because I alluded to it. Now I'm getting around to it. 
he was asked how confident is he that the Cardinals front office is going to be able to get the three impact arms that are needed this offseason. The three impact arms that John Mozeliak said, in, impact arms, starting arms, whatever you want to call it. He said we're going to, you know, Mo said the Cardinals are going to get three starters. That was August 14th. How confident is Ollie that that's going to come to fruition? He was asked that on Sunday. He said, quote, we'll see. That's what's needed. We'll see how it all pans out. But you're asking me what's needed. That is what's needed. To compete at a high level and not only win the division, but actually compete for a World Series, that's what you need. And then the reporter said, that's a big ask, right? Like this, And my, Ollie said, that's what's needed. <laughs> so it's very clear to me that he's not backing off of anything. And I'm glad I asked Ollie this question as well, especially after hearing that John Mozeliak was outside telling Jim Hayes that, well, when I said three starters, maybe I didn't really mean three starters. I asked Ollie, like, you feel like everybody knows that what's needed and you're encouraged by everyone being on the same page, the conversations you've had with the front office. That's why I asked Ollie. He said, quote, I've been highly encouraged with the conversations that I've had with Mo and our front office up to this point. Is it difficult to do to get three starters? Yes. Is everyone on the same page as to what's needed? Yes. So he says the conversations have been good. He is confident that the organization from ownership to front office to everybody involved knows that they need to approach pitching differently. I won't pin that down as to like, okay, Ollie and Mo are at odds. Contradictory. Well, it maybe not. Like Mo didn't say they're not going to get three starters. He did say depth is going to be important. Ollie said we know what we all know what's needed. So now it's going to be a matter of will they get what's needed. And like it's not Ollie is is not leaving room for interpretation. He was asked about the fan skepticism that it can happen quickly that the Cardinals can turn things around in one offseason. And he said, it'll be an important offseason. We'll see. I'm not here to calm anybody down. It's on us to fix it. So there are no words here to put a little safety blanket over it. It's on us to fix it. We have a couple of months to do it, and we'll see if we do it. Very point blank. And again, Cardinals fans, I don't know where the arrogant comments come from. I guess I do. Like, he's got a very sense of bravado when he speaks. But again, I would want that in my manager. If I had a, a stake in a team, I would want to hear the guys say, yeah, we got to get it fixed. It wasn't good enough, and we should fix it. He It was referenced that, you know, there are some fans who, you know, call for your head, Ollie, and he said, well, they should. They should be pissed because there's a standard here in St. Louis and it's not been met. He's, he's not shying away from any of that, Cardinals fans. So I guess go ahead and call for his head. It's not going to happen, and it's not going to affect him doing his job. But the proof will be in the pudding. There is nothing other than how many games they win next year and whether they fix it. What happens at that point? That was kind of a point of contention in the manager's office where what's at stake was the question. And is it that the the Cardinals become known as this organization that's just a non-contending organization? Is that what happens after a 90-loss season? And if you compound it with another one, what is what are the stakes here? And that's a tough question to answer, tough question to ask, tough question to ponder, because we know that John Mozeliak's time is coming to an end anyway. And it's going to be by his choice. But that was supposed to be after 2025. Bill DeWitt has been clear that he's going to see out his entire contract, so we don't right now have any reason to believe that that's going to change. Anything can happen, but I don't. I, I would be stunned if Monday or whenever this press conference is, Mo says, yeah, I'm stepping down into an advisory role and somebody else is going to take my job. That would stun me. I don't think it's happening right now. I think everybody knows that this is a huge offseason. A, for Mo, if, for him to just drop the mic and go, eh, it's your guys' problem now after a season like this, that would tarnish the legacy. So I don't think that's coming. But this is a big one. And it's going to be the kind of offseason that leads to the kind of actual season that either allows Mo to ride off into the sunset after 2025 because 2024 went so well and then everybody kind of calms down or it goes the other way and we're like, well, were there stakes to this and our, our head's going to roll? How is that going to go? I don't believe Ollie we've seen in like a contract extension. So I think this is his last year under contract. So maybe that question of what's at stake is, is kind of written into, you know, it's baked in already. It's going to be a really interesting off season, everybody. There are maybe some things in this episode that I had meant to say I had cataloged mentally, but 
I knew that I had it jam packed, and so we're 50 minutes in, and I've probably not gone to everything that I wanted to say. But let me know in the comments below what do you want to hear about. More conversation about, more discussion about this Cardinals offseason as a lot of stuff has to happen. What do you think about the notion that John Mozeliak may be backing off the three starters come in a little bit? Or are we reading too much into what he said to Jim Hayes and, and really he still, we believe, and have faith, knows what's needed for this Cardinals team this winter? How do you feel about it? What's your take on all these comments about got to weed out the guys who aren't here for the right reasons? So a lot of stuff packed into this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Hit like on the video. Hit subscribe on the channel and leave your comments below. I'm going to wrap it up here. Appreciate you guys, as always, for listening. Stay tuned to this channel on YouTube and to the B-Shape Daily Podcast feed for more Cardinals content all offseason. Thank you guys so much, and we'll talk to you next time on B-Shape Daily. Peace!